Okay, guys, let's uh, resume the session. So um, I'm going to be talking about VP9, just like Alex, except that I'm going to talk about how you can do VP9 without using libvpx. All right. So the first three slides I'm going to show are basically like a summary of what I showed last year. So I gave a talk last year, and there were basically two parts to that talk. The first part was that you can use libvpx to encode VP9 video. And if you do that, you will get quality that is essentially comparable to what X265 gives you. And more interestingly, much, much better than what X264 gives you. I'm not the only one claiming this. Everybody basically accepts this now. Like this, this is a fact, right? A few days ago, Netflix did a talk at a scientific gathering, SPIE. They said the exact same thing. So um, what you see in this graph, this is sort of like the summary slide from last year is vertical axis quality, horizontal axis bit rates. As the bit rate goes up, obviously quality goes up also. But if you look at like specific points for the blue curve, X264, you will see that at the same bit rate, the quality on the vertical axis that you get for HTVC using X265 for VP9 using libvpx is higher. So you get better quality for the same bit rate. Or if you want the same quality point, you need less bits. Right, so the number that we attach to this is something like 40, 50 percent, and what that means is that X264 needs 40 or 50 percent bits, 40 or 50 percent more bits than HEVC or uh, VP9 to get the same quality. Um, so that's cool. And then the second part of the encoding talk that I showed last year was this graph. And what this shows is that this bitrate improvement on the vertical axis as a function of encoding time. So as you make the encoding faster and faster by letting the encoder drop particular encoding decisions, the quality obviously goes down. And at these high spots that you saw the previous graphs, HEVC and VP9 using X265 and libvpx may be better, but they're also like 10, 20x slower. And then if you reduce their speed settings to get comparable speeds, their quality actually goes down. For X265, back then, what was, what, what was happening is that as you go to like an X264 preset, like a speed setting that's comparable to X264 very slow, your quality actually drops down to something that is barely any better, right? So what you see here is that the second plot, uh, the second point from the right on the blue curve essentially intersects with the green curve, which is X265. So normalized for CPU usage, X265 back then wasn't actually better. They've done a lot of work on that since then, but I'm just summarizing what I showed last year. X2, uh, LibVPX was slightly better. So in terms of like um, bang for your CPU, Buck. The point of this slide was that VP9 is a pretty good choice. The second thing that I that I showed last year was uh, VP9 decoding. That was the decoder that me and Clement wrote uh, as part of FFmpeg. So we called it FFVP9, and it was a really really fast decoder. So if you do same quality file comparisons with other codecs like 264 or HEVC, this decoder gave you a much faster frame output. Uh, and if you compared it with libvpx, it was still about like 20 to 30 percent faster. So that was the summary slide of last year. So we have a decoder that is like 20 to 30 percent faster. It's free, it's safe, it's fast. It's multi-threading, supports all of these things, and a bunch of to-do items on the right. So I'm going to start from the to-do items at this point. So the biggest thing in my opinion, that was left in the decoder as of last year was the profile 2 tree or 10 and 12 bits per, uh, bit, bits per component sample optimizations. So the decoder supported it, but it was really, really slow. Uh, we fixed that, uh, so that's a good thing. Uh, so this is sort of like the current to-do list. Uh, in the same fashion, AVX2 back then was missing, and that's currently being worked on. So the IDCT for 8 bits has been ported to AVX2. That works, gives pretty good speed ups, like, like overall probably about 10% decoder speed up. Uh, still has to be done for the 10, 12 bit decoder. Uh, and I'm currently working on the loop filter as well. So those are really cool speed ups and they make the decoder measure, measurably faster. Um, what's interesting about that is now that we have this decoder and it is so good, we actually start seeing user uptake, right? So it's important to remember VP9, just like VP8, is a web codec. And a web codec is a codec that is primarily streamed over the internet. So who are the users of VP8 or VP9? 
there are people that stream YouTube videos. And YouTube is typically streamed either to your phone, which will have a hardware decoder, or to your browser. So the biggest market, so to say, for a software decoder is your browser. And FFPP9 has been picked up by Mozilla as of, as of a few months ago, I think. They have this, this, this strange solution. They call it FFVPX. It's sort of like the VP3 and 8 and 9 decoders from FFmpeg ripped out from FFmpeg and then into a library, which is sort of like libvpx. But, you know, whatever they do, I think that's really cool. So we actually have a browser using FFVP9 as a decoder. And that's something that, you know, as a whole community, we should be proud of. Sadly, Chrome doesn't want to use FFVP9. Uh, the reason that I've been given is that it's too big. Um, that's, that's, that's a fair reason. I mean, the decoder is not um, any bigger than other decoders of its sort, right? It's like about a megabyte in total. The HTVC decoder is a megabyte, the LibVPX decoder is a megabyte. And I think what we're caught in here is sort of like cross currents where they're trying to, let's say, like reduce the obesity of Chrome overall. Because Chrome is pretty big, right? And you don't want it to you know, keep growing exponentially. And so they just say no more growth at all. And so as part of that, that means that there's currently no space for FFVP9 in Chrome. I'm hoping that at some point that will change, or maybe at some point I'll be able to make it smaller, and then hopefully Chrome will be picked up as a user as well. Uh, new to-do item is no alpha support. That was something new that Google added to VP9. Uh, but the biggest thing, and the thing that I want to talk about for the rest of today, is uh, FFVP9 is a decoder. And if you want to work with VP9, you need an encoder as well. So that brings me to EVE. So EVE is something that I've worked on for the past, I'd say, two or two and a half years. So I actually had been working on it for a long time last year already, except that I didn't want to talk to people about it because it was sort of like um, a secret hobby project. Um, so. Eve is best described as the FFVP9 encoder. So the same way that FFVP9 was written as a decoder for VP9 that does not suffer from some of the drawbacks that libvpx has, right? Which is libvpx is a research code base. And so it's, it's important to be able to extend it and to be able to understand and read the code base. Uh, it's used in standardization and all that kind of stuff. Um, I don't care about any of that. I just want it to be fast. So uh, back when I talked about FFVP9, 20 to 30% speed increase is pretty good. Now, let's talk about libvpx as an encoder. The biggest complaints that people have about it are, you know, from what I've heard, is there's no multi-threading, the rate control sucks, um, it's very slow, it's blurry. So why don't we grow, group all of those together and we call them libvpx issues rather than vp9 issues, and we write a vp9 encoder that doesn't have those issues. That, that sounds really cool, doesn't it? So that is Eve. Now, before I get into the results, um, one thing that I want to mention is that currently Eve is not yet open source. Now, that's an awkward thing to mention in an open source conference, right? There, there's, there's reasons for that. And th these reasons are largely um, economic in nature, right? At some point, I've worked on this for two and a half years, most of that full time. And at some point, I unfortunately have to pay the rent. I could go for an exclusive for licensing model. But the problem is for a web codec, my users don't ship the software, so it doesn't help me. If you don't ship the software, then you don't care what the license of the software is as far as distribution goes. So I'm trying to figure out how to make this work. And I, I'm, I'm not 100% sure yet. But so, you know, just from the start, I want to say that currently this is not open source, but I hope that you will at least be enthusiastic about this, uh, you know, me being a member of this community. And I'll get, uh, we can, I, I can encode samples for you if you want. Okay. <laughs> oh, so so he wants a free license so that he can uh, he can he can encode his rips. Well, send me the files and I'll I'll, I'll get you started. How about that? Okay. So um, let's talk about results now, right? So um, I'm not going to show comparisons to X two six five. I could, but um, the thing that I focused on most so far is basically how this compares to libvpx. Right? And then based on earlier observations on how libvpx compares to, to x265, you can probably deduce how, how, those, how it will compare to x265 also. Okay, so having said that, um, 
these are encoding results on uh, a standardized test set that uh, I think Netflix has contributed to XIF. So those are called like the 4K test set um, on, on XIF standards media, media library. Uh, they were downsampled to 360p and then encoded using, you know, sort of like uh, state-of-the-art slowest um, encoding settings for X264, X264, uh, libvpx, X264, and, and my encoder. Uh, and then what you're looking at is uh, how many less bits does my encoder need to get to the same quality? Uh, and then the quality metric that you use turns out to not be very interesting. Like the results are stable regardless of what quality metric you use. But so in this case, uh, just for the sake of having a metric, this is PSNR. So what you see in the bottom line overall is that you need about like 7.5% less bits to get the same quality. And compared to X264, it's about a 15% reduction almost. Uh, and that's very cool, especially the first number, because these are encoders for the same format. So just by making encoding decisions differently, apparently we can improve the results by quite a bit. Um, the second column that you're looking at is encoding time. And for me, that is really the key factor. People always complain how slow libvpx is. So these are all single-threaded results, so it's not like I'm doing multi-threading and they're not. But for an average encoding time of between one and a half, one and a half second per frame, uh, I'm actually a third of a second faster in libvpx while still having a 7.5% bitrate reduction at the same time. That is pretty cool, right? And of course, x264 is much, much faster. That is not a surprise because, you know, h264 is a much less complex format. So, uh, no, the second column is, is an absolute difference. So, in seconds per frame. So, um, the, so the average, uh, uh, let, let me show it uh, like in a graph context. So, on average, you will get about like between one and one and a half seconds per frame. And then my encoder needs a third of a second per frame less than libvpx. And one second per frame more than x264. Is it the same at 1080p? Well, at 1080p, the, the speed differences are proportionally the same, but of course, the absolute numbers are different. But yes, at 1080p, the relative difference holds. Um, okay, so, so these are example uh, images for the results that I just showed. So what you see on the left is basically a clip where uh, in blue, you see my encoder versus red libvpx and green uh, x264. Uh, you might think that the graphs are closer together than like an image that I showed you know, earlier, like copied from last year. Uh, that is partially true. One of the reasons is because this graph is squashed, so uh, the, the, axis, like the, the unit on the axis is larger. And secondly, it's because it's 360p and the image back then was 1080p. So the differences grow relative to X264 as the screen resolution goes up. Uh, and then on the right, what you see is encoding time. And in the low to medium end, I'm always faster in libvpx. On a high end, it typically converges. Uh, fortunately, most people that use VP vp9 will be doing it in the bitrate spectrum that's more on the left of this graph. So in that end, the quality is better and the speed is higher, which is pretty cool. Um, another thing that my encoder does much better than libvpx is uh, bitrate targeting. So these are tables where the left three, uh, three uh, columns of numbers give you a rate miss percentage. And a rate miss percentage is basically uh, if my target rate was X and my actual rate was Y, what is the percentage difference, uh, right, the absolute percentage difference between X and Y? And so what you see for X264 and for my encoder, they're pretty close. It's like two and a half and like, like three and a half, almost 4%. Whereas for libvpx, it's close to 10%. So libvpx is uh, rate control is indeed not very good, like these numbers show that. But um, that is not an issue with VP9, that is an issue with libvpx, and we can fix that. Uh, the, the right three columns show uh, the absolute max rate target miss, and so that's basically the worst case. So of all of the clips, or all of the bit rates per clip, what was the worst rate miss uh, for all of the tested uh, rate samples? And the worst one for libvpx is 150%. That's really quite a lot, right? So my file, I wanted it to be 100 megabytes, but it turned out 250 megabytes. It's hard to work with an encoder that is so far off in, in, in individual cases, right? And then x264 and my encoder are better. Okay, now, uh, and, and this is sort of like an image that shows a 
pro probably like one of the best cases for my encoder, where I'm very close to zero and libppx is not. Um, so, you know, I could talk about other things like multi-threading, so my encoder is, uh, has better multi-threading than libvpx or stuff like that. But um, rather than talking about metrics, let's actually look at um, images or videos rather, because who cares about video other than what it looks like? So let's open this one. Uh, all right, so what you're looking at here, um, let me see, boo. And I'm gonna go about like halfway to video. Oh, whoa. And it crashed, that's great. Okay, um, I'm gonna try that one more time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, guys. Um, <laughs> that would be great, yeah. No, I, I played with this earlier today. I don't know. Yeah, the, the, yeah this is, anyway, the, this is research code. This is what you get from research codes. Um, don't insult researchers, please. I'm so sorry. All right, so let's do this again. Okay, so what we're looking at here, so this is a stream analyzer that I use, uh, you know, in my personal research. Uh, you see a white line in the middle, that thin white line in the middle. Uh, that's a separator between two encoded videos. On the left, the one encoded with my encoder, and on the right, the one encoded with libvpx. And by pressing buttons on my screen, uh, so these are the encoded videos, I can go to the source, which is this, and the compressed video. And I hope you sort of like saw small changes there. Okay, so let's look a little bit at, you know, things that are happening in this uh, sample. So. Uh, thank you. So uh, let's let's start looking at this piece here. So there, uh, you can see um, a girl in the background, and it's a little bit dark for you guys. So uh, let me see if I can brighten that. Is that better? That's probably better, right? So. <laughs> Oh, so you guys like this. Yeah, anyway, look, this just turns up the brightness. So, um, Someone asked you last year about uh, getting a copy of your analyzer. It's on the App Store nowadays, so you can actually get it on the App Store. Um, so what you see here, this is, uh, you're currently looking at a girl encoded with libvpx. And so the original actually looks like this. Um, this is blur, right? This is, this, this is probably, the most severe uh, complaints that people have had quality-wise about libvpx. Like, the numbers look really good, and in terms of PSNR, this actually looks pretty good. But it's blurry. Um, my encoder does a little bit better. Like, uh, it still doesn't retain all the details, but it, at least it retains some of the details. Um, what's interesting is if you look at the bottom in the hands of this guy, you can see that the lemon, which is there in the source, actually disappeared in libvpx, but my encoder shows it just fine. Right? This is zoomed in, so it probably looks a little bit pixelated. But um, there, there are a lot of, like, I'm going to call them like small artifacts. Right? So you can probably see the same thing here. Uh, so let me get the highlights away. Where this one is encoded with my encoder, the blue guy's shirt, and this is encoded with libvpx. So, the point that I'm trying to make here is that these number differences that you saw earlier, they don't just correspond to better numbers. They actually correspond to better visual quality. And that's exactly what we want. Right? Uh, let's see if I can point out something else. Uh, I think the bar area here at the bottom is a pretty good indication of that. So if you, if, if you look at the differences between, in this case, libvpx, and then in the other case, my encoder, again, the, let's call it like the energy retention is much better. Uh, color retention, if you look at the glasses here, is also better because in libvpx, both glasses are yellow, but actually one of them is supposed to be orange, as you can see from the source. So point being here is that it's interesting to have improvements in numbers, but what's equally important is to actually have improvements in visual quality. And I think in my encoder, what you're seeing here, is that those numbers do actually correspond to better visual quality as well, which is really cool. Um, 
If you guys want, I can show a visual comparison to X264 as well. Do you, anyone? Let's just do it. Oops. Uh, let's just uh, do one versus X264 also. Um, the kind of artifacts that you're going to look at with X264 are different, but um, you still see the same thing. I'm, I'm choosing a different clip here because uh, the type of artifacts that you see in LibVP, uh, sorry, in X264. Um, are more easily visible uh, in this sample. So we're sort of going to focus on these guys here. Um, what you're looking at here is, let me see, on the left you have my encoder, and on the right you have X264, and then this is the source. So um, if you look at like energy retention, uh, it, X264 does pretty well, right? So like the faults in the shirt of this guy, which are not there in, uh, in, in the libvpx encodes, they're actually there in both of the encodes here. So that's, that's good. Um, let me make it a little bit brighter so that you guys can see it, okay? So the interesting artifacts that you see with X264 can be seen, for example, in this guy's glove area. So if you look at the source, you will see that it's basically just a red area with you know, like, like a white logo here. But if you go to the encoded version, you will see all these um, strange dark and light pixels that weren't there in the original. This is high frequency noise. And this is sort of like an artifact that you get when you try to do energy retention and you overdo it or it basically just doesn't work anymore. So high frequency noise is very prevalent with X264, whereas in my encoder, that noise is much less. You can also see it in this guy's face on top here, right? There's basically high frequency noise everywhere, which I wouldn't say it's the inverse of blur, but um, it certainly isn't any more visually pleasing. So it's a different artifact, but it's still there. And again, my encoder has much less of that. So again, the number of improvements that you're looking at correspond to an improvement in visual experience as well. Uh, let's go back here. So. So, so a very quick summary of this encoder that I've written is uh, it can do CRF, VBR, it's multi-threaded, optimized for visual quality, uh, has uh, improvements in quality, not just numbers, but also visual quality relative to libvpx and x264. And in the case of libvpx, it goes along with an improvement in speed also at the same time. So those are really interesting numbers, right? Uh, the question that you're going to ask me first is probably why would you care, because it's closed source, right? Well, the closed source part is sad, yes, but one, you know, I'm a member of this community. This is stuff that I'm working on, right? So when JB asks me, can you talk about stuff that you're working on, this is, you know, this is what I'm working on. Then secondly, the improvements that I make in the encoder for as far as applicable, will be backported to the decoder as well, right? I mean, a decoder and an encoder do share particular pieces of functionality, and some of those are just the reconstruction portion, and others of those are the SIMD implementations of things like the IDCT and the motion compensation. So when I make improvements in those, for example, AVX2 versions, I backport those to the decoder as well. And then lastly, having a better encoder is is an improvement in the competitive spectrum, right? So competition prevents complacency. And so at the very least, what I hope that this encoder can do is show that you can do really awesome stuff with VP9, and you can do that with VPX as well, or with X265, and so on. And so rather than being complacent, I want all of these encoders to be better, because that's good for everyone overall. So um, with that, I want to say thank you for listening, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Then, yeah, how does it compare to X two six five? So, like I said, from the you know from the earlier results that I showed, to what Netflix showed at SPIE, you can basically derive that. Uh, I don't include X two six five in my day to day comparisons. Uh, the basic reason for that is that most people that um, play with my encoder, um, they don't care about HEVC all that much, so they don't want to. They don't want to hear those results. Um, I, I I could certainly include those next time I give a talk on this. Yes. But can you say something right now? Or? Uh, it, it's about the same, really. I I, I mean the, the the differences that that you're gonna see are gonna be in a you know low single digit uh, where whether it's up or down is basically a function of noise. It's approximately the same. Like, like HEVC, VP9 are really very close together. Um, 
right? And, and these aren't just my numbers. Netflix confirmed that. Uh, and, you know, there's research papers that show that also. Um, I'm sure that uh, uh, Pr Pradeep, I think, uh, uh, we'll, we'll talk about that. So we'll, we'll, we'll hear more about that. Um, yes. Uh, yes? Do you know when your store at I'm sorry? Do you know when your encoder is store at high bit rates? How does my encoder compare to the VPX at high bit rates? Oh, oh, why am I slower? Okay, I'm sorry. Um, basically, the, um, most of the speed optimizations that I've done are um, sort of like at uh, excluding particular coefficient coding paths based on you know number of coefficients and stuff like that. And at the high bitrate spectrum end, you have so many non-zero co coefficients that for me, those particular thresholds that I set are not just are just not met. So uh, it's not that the encoder cannot be faster, it's just that I haven't bothered to uh, tune them for the higher bitrate settings, if that makes sense. So, so speed, um, although certainly like a design principle for my encoder, is not something that I've tuned it uh, very much to yet, because, well, you know, um, most people think this is good enough. Um, it, it could certainly be, done, be better, yes. Uh, yes? In your, uh, you had a comparison chart uh, that showed uh, the per frame rate cost of encoding compared to VPX. Yes. That basically it was, you know, on average 300 milliseconds faster per frame. Yes. Uh, what, what's the absolute encoding time? One, between one and one and a half second a frame. Okay. So, so it's about like 20, 30% faster. Uh, it, it, the, set, the question is, are the settings real world? Uh, it, it depends on who the user is, right? So, oh, the samples. So the, the samples, they, they are real world samples uh, for certain types of users. So, so they're basically broadcast quality samples. Um, and within that subset of media out there, they're considered uh, very representative, yes. Uh, the, yeah, so how does it compare on anime or uh, game encoded stuff? So on animations, uh, it's, I would say it's not like between 5 and 10% better anymore. It's more like between 0 and 5. Um, uh, and I haven't tested anime yet, I guess. Um, but, but so uh, certainly specific types of content need different types of tunings. And the people that I work with right now that want to evaluate my encoder, they use, you know, the real world... Uh, sort of media. So um, that's the primary thing that I'm optimizing for right now. The other things have to be done, yes. Jana? Uh, oh, which version of libvpx? Uh, so the version that I used was from like uh, halfway 2016, like uh, probably April or May 2016. So it's a few months old at this point. Um, I, I think most of the rate control improvements that he was talking about were in there at that point, um, but it, it may have improved by like one or two percent since then. Um, I think I'm done. So, sorry, I'm being uh, flagged off. Uh, one more question. One more question. Yes. Yes, oh yeah, so the results that I showed for v are for VBRs, uh, two pass, uh, one pass CRF, the results are essentially identical. The quality difference compared to LiveVPX is slightly bigger, and that is not so much because my encoder is better, but rather because LiveVPX is worse than one pass CRF. But all the other results stand. Are you looking for team members to help you work on this? Yes, if, if people want to join my company, I would love to hire people. Um, thanks for bringing that up. Okay, that's it. Thank you, guys. <laughs>